Welcome Connecting Point. So after the last month, we've had a wonderfully dynamic speaker speaking on the Book of Ruth. Um, so today we're going to get back to the Book of Judges and we're going to start a study on, the, on Samson. Now this is quite a famous story and most people know it. Um, he's known for his amazing feats of strength and especially for his encounter with Delilah. And we'll talk about her next week. Um, he's very likely the best known of the Judges. Um, he's also the most self-serving, least obedient, and least accomplished of any of the judges. Uh, Samson's is a story that we tell our children when they're growing up in Sunday school, and it's another one of those that's probably the least uh, appropriate story to tell our children, uh, ranking right up there with Noah's Ark. So um, this may disappoint some of you, but I have, I have nothing good to say about Samson. I've tried and I've thought about it for, for weeks and I found it very hard to come up with a good lesson here. It seems the best lesson to take from Samson is to do the opposite of everything he does. He's kind of the George Costanza of the Old Testament where everything he did was always the wrong choice. This in part is why I chose to do Samson. I saw someone who makes bad decisions over and over and I wanted to find the good moral. I also knew that he was mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter of faith. So I concluded, as most people do, that he was a great example of faith and I had to find, find out what that example is. Turns out there's only one moment in his life where he turns to God, but even that request is totally motivated by selfishness and revenge. So I'll say it again, after further review, there is nothing good to say about Samson. So we've reached a point in the book of Judges where we can start to draw on the book of Samuel for context. Samuel starts with a bunch of battle scenes between Israel and, and the Philistines. Eli is alive, he's the second to last judge of Israel. And actually one year after the rise of Samson, Samuel is born. Uh, chapter 4 in Samuel, 1 Samuel that is, tells us the story of where the two nations are in battle. And Israel is actually routed really badly. The Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant and place it in their temple for, for their god, Dagon. This temple was in the city of Ashdod. Uh, the story gets very amusing when the Philistines arrive the next day. They find that all the idols, the Dagonite idol, idols, have fallen over as if they're bowing to the one true God. Um, and then the uh, Philistines start to break out in hemorrhoids and tumors, and uh, that's when they decide we better send this thing back. So they did. So this event actually happened the same year that Samson died. Um, that temple was in Ashdod. The temple that Samson tore down was in Gaza. So they weren't the same city. Um, in my mind, the story would have been much more dramatic if it happened in the same temple, but I didn't write the Bible, so. Um, Another important, to event, or sorry, another important event to add to this storyline is that Saul is anointed king about six years after Samson dies. So our passage today will be Judges chapter 13 through 15. Unfortunately, there's a lot to read, so I'm going to summarize most of it. As I point out the many failures between Samson and his culture, just think about today's church and society. Do you see any similarities? So verse 1 of chapter 13 starts off this way. The Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight, so that the Lord handed them over to the Philistines for 40 years. So here we are, one verse in, and we see a marked difference from, from previous stories in this book. Did you catch it? This time there was absolutely no mention of Israel crying out to God. So I made up a little chart to show what has happened so far in uh, the history of, of the Judges period. I wanted to show you who the oppressors were and how long Israel had been oppressed. It's not exhaustive, but as you can see, Israel now has been oppressed for 40 years. This is twice as long as any other previous oppression. 
Other times I re realized their predicament after seven or eight years. Also in all the previous stories, Israel cried out to God to save them from their slavery. This time there is no mention of, of them asking God for help. This is our first indication of how far the Israelites have strayed from God. So we'll go to a table talk, and the question I have for you right now is, why do you think that they did not cry out to God this time? They have seen his deliverance several times, over and over again. Why did it stop now? Okay, so our story then introduces us to Samson's father, Manoah. His mother is also mentioned, but she's not named. She is described as barren, which is a very common theme in the Bible. Uh, one day, an angel of the Lord appears to Samson's mother, and she is told that she will have a son. Throughout the Bible, God excels at producing life where there is no hope or expectation of life. This son is to be raised and live his life under a Nazarite vow. And we'll talk about that later too. Um, Mum is not allowed to drink alcohol and is not allowed to eat anything unclean. Here's another clue to the state of the culture. Israel has forgotten one of the most basic rules regarding food. They had list of foods that, or lists of foods that they weren't supposed to eat. Even though it was a ritual law, many of these laws were very practical given their life in a very hot climate. For example, uh, don't eat seafood when you live in a desert. It will probably make an attempt on your life. So, it's easy to keep this law, but it seems that even the simple law, they weren't even able to adhere to it. So we have another appearance from the angel of the Lord, which we know to be God himself. He tells the woman that her son will begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now here's another point that is very important to our story, but I won't. I'm going to bring our attention to it now, and the first to later, please remember this point. Uh, Samson will begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So after the angel goes away, the woman tells her husband of the experience. We are told that the angel appeared to her, but she relates to her husband that a man of God appeared to her. She explains that he appeared to look like an angel of God, but fails to understand that it truly was an angel of God. She is so close to the truth, but cannot quite understand it. So at this point, Manoah steps in. He asks the Lord to reappear so they can know how to raise the child. At first glance, it seems like a noble act. Please teach us how to raise this child. Instead, it's very arrogant. He is upset with the fact that his wife was consulted and he was not. He is the head of the household, after all. Manoah is sexist and insecure. But as it turns out, the angel does reappear, but, she, but he reappears to his wife. So when he does reappear, the wife goes and grabs Manoah and says, Hey, come on, come talk to this guy, here he is. And again, Manoah asks, How should this child be raised? And I love the angel's response. Raise a child exactly how I told your wife to raise a child. Come on, Manoah. So eventually, Manoah offers to make a meal for the guest. Even this seems like a reasonable and hospitable offer. Apparently, it is very self-serving. In the pagan culture around Israel, it was thought to be hospitable to another, especially to one that is a higher rank than oneself, is to control them. There is an expectation that the higher ranking individual is going to return the favor to the benefit of the individual. And then at the end of chapter 13, Samson is born. His parents name him Samson, which translates to little son and that's S-U-N. They are naming their child after the Philistine sun god. In a culture where names are very significant and often describe their personality or destiny, some Israelites are naming their children after pagan gods. And the final clue that shows us how far the culture has strayed can be found in chapter 15. 
here, in this part of the story, you will see that Samson is right in the thick of it, in full conflict with the Philistines. He is pushing their buttons. They camp out in Judean territory in order to capture Samson. The Judites start to get worried, and when they find out Samson is the cause, they approach him in order to capture him and take him to the Philistines. The Judeans are working to help their oppressors in order to keep the peace. They appear to be quite comfortable with their oppression. So that pretty much sums up the culture at the t of the people of God at this time. They are oppressed, they are unwilling to call out to God, and even fight to help the oppressors. They do not follow the most ba basic dietary laws. They are oppressive to their own women and work for their own interests. They are raising their children to follow the, their incorrect ways. Now that's quite a list, and shows just how far they have walked away from the days of glory and conquest they experienced in the days of Joshua. In the midst of all this, God is there. He acts. He provides a means of salvation, and it is completely His own initiative. This shows His sovereignty, and salvation is sourced from Him and Him alone. So now let's turn to the life of Samson. His parents are instructed to raise him within the bounds of the Nazarite vow. Back in chapter 6 in the book of Numbers, you will find the full details. This vow was usually voluntary. In our story, Samson did not choose this, but he was dedicated before he was born. He was supposed to be dedicated to the service of God and, and to be holy. The Nazarite vow did not allow the person to drink wine, beer, vinegar, or anything that was fermented. They couldn't, eat, they couldn't drink grape juice or even eat grapes. Secondly, he could not cut his hair throughout his vow. We all know the importance that this plays in the story, and we will discuss that next week as well. Finally, the vow strictly prohibits the Nazarite from touching a dead body. Most of this chapter in Numbers instructs a person how to cleanse himself if he were to find himself accidentally defiled by a dead body. Samson was to live under this vow. Now let's pick up the story in chapter 14. He's now an adult. He lives his life much like the culture that surrounds him. He has no regard for God's ways. He has no regard for his vow. He only does what is right in his own eyes. You may re remember we've been using this phrase as a summary of the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. I was surprised to find out that this verse appears for the first time six verses after Samson's death. As a leader, he set the tone for the entire culture. Perhaps they were already headed that way, but Samson definitely set them up to go that direction. So as with most young men, Samson's heart turns to love. He falls in love with a Philistine woman and asks his parents to set him up. They are offended and insist that he reconsider and marry an Israelite. And at this point they use very derogatory language towards the Philistines to make their point. Covenant law also makes it very clear that Israelite men are to marry Israelite women. To do otherwise is to risk being led away from one's faith. Samson insists that his parents arrange the marriage. He demands that they get her for me, for she looks good to me. Already his eyes are controlling his actions. Other judges are motivated by logic or desire for what is right and good. Samson is motivated by lust and is never able to get out from under it. Verse 4 is an interesting footnote to the story. It says that Samson's father and mother did not know that this desire to marry a Philistine woman was of the Lord, for he was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. Now to be clear, God did not give Samson his lust and desire for foreign women, but he is using Samson despite his sin and selfishness. So finally his parents agree, and they travel to go arrange the marriage. Along the way, Samson is attacked by a lion. We are told that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, and he killed the lion. 
Samson achieves an amazing feat, but he does not mention it to his parents when he rejoins them on the walk to get his bride. Later in the story, as they are walking home, he sees the lion again, but this time it has been inhabited by bees and it's full of honey. He takes some of the honey to eat and offers some to his parents. Here he is twice defiling, or sorry, here he is twice touching a dead carcass. Now stipulation number three of the Nazarite vow is not to touch a dead body. The first time he does it, it's unexpected, and the second time, it's deliberate. Every day, day Israelites are supposed to avoid touching dead things. Nazarites, even more so. Turns out there's an eight-day ritual of cleansing, cutting his hair, washing, and sacrificing animals to restore Samson back to his vow. He does none of that. This is likely why he did not tell his parents after the first encounter with the lion. They would likely insist that he follow the rules. An act of bringing his parents honey also makes them unclean. Not only does he defile himself, he defiles his parents as well. But why would he spend all that time, or why would he bother with all that time-consuming rituals when he has a woman to marry? He's completely controlled by his sensual desires. As the day of marriage approaches, Samson arranges a seven-day feast to celebrate. This is very typical for this culture. There will be a lot of food and wine. Even though our passage does not actually state this, it is very likely that Samson would have drunk with the rest of the guests in clear violation of the first stipulation of his vow. As we know, alcohol tends to dull people's wisdom. Samson asks a riddle of 30 of his Philistine companions. He bets 30 changes of clothing that they cannot guess it. This is the riddle he puts forth. From the eater comes out something to eat. From the strong comes something sweet. Now to you and I, because we got the Bible, we know that this is a direct reference to his experience with the lion. To his opponents, it's an impossible riddle. Kind of reminds me of Bilbo Baggins and Gollum when, when Bilbo wins, they have a, a riddle battle. But Bilbo wins when he asks the question, what's in my pocket? Another like impossible question. So now we have Samson, who was unwilling to fess up to his encounter with the lion because of the inconvenience it would cause, is now playing games with that. He's playing games with what has defiled him. I suspect wine may have played a role in all of this. This is not uncommon and happens in our times. This reminds me of a story I heard when, you know, there are riots wherever and people go run in and steal TV and then they post it on Facebook that they stole a TV and then they get arrested because they posted that they stole a TV on Facebook. It's, it's a similar situation here. Samson is so comfortable with sin that it becomes a game. So of course his friends are not able to guess his riddle. It seems that 30 changes of clothing is quite a pricey bet. And after three days they start to put pressure on Samson's wife to find out the answer. In fact, they threaten to burn her and her family to death if she does not find out the answer. Under great duress, she starts to pressure Samson. He again gains, gains some morals and explains that he cannot tell her because he never told his parents. So the question becomes, why will he not tell those he loves but will play games with his friends? In the end, she puts enough pressure on Samson, who relents, and his wife passes the information on to the others. Samson is so furious at his loss that he leaves the party. And for the second time, we are told that the the spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson and he kills 30 Philistines. He takes their clothing and he pays his debt and runs back home to his father. So after some time passes, he realizes that he did not get to experience the fullness of his marriage. He returns to his wife so he can give her a hug. We all know that newly married couples like to hug a lot. So, um, once he arrives, he finds out that her father had given her to his best man. In frustration, 
He captures 300 foxes. He ties them by their tails in pairs with a torch and lets them loose in the fields of standing grain. Capturing and tying up 300 foxes is quite a feat. To let them loose in an order to burn the standing grain is a serious insult. Standing grain means that the grain had been cut and gathered into bundles so that it could dry. Once dried, the grain could be separated from the stalks and be stored for future use. He burned their harvest right after it had been cut, but before it had been stored. So you can imagine that it would be a few months uh, before the next harvest would be ready. Having, a, I'm guessing, 150 fields burned is a significant loss and would quite likely lead to famine. Naturally, the Philistines are very angry. When they find out it was Samson, they burn his wife and her family and go after Samson. It is at this point that the Judites become involved. Instead of standing up to the Philistines, they help him. They help to and offer to capture Samson. Samson does not put a, up a fuss with the Judites and allows them to turn him over to the Philistines. And for the third time, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson and he breaks the ropes that are tying him up. He picks up the jawbone of a donkey and kills a thousand men, another significant feat. At the end of chapter 15, we are told that Samson judged Israel for 20 years. So what did he accomplish? You may, you may remember that Samson's purpose was to begin the process of liberating Israel. This starts with the, his marriage to the Philistine woman. Samson sought marriage for his own gratification, and God used his selfishness to accomplish his will. And I'll say it again. God was not the author of Samson's selfish desire. He still used it for his goal. There is an obvious tip for tap pattern to the story that comes out. The stakes get higher and higher as it goes. At his wedding feast, Samson tries to outsmart the Philistines with a riddle. They threaten to kill his wife to find the answer and end up outsmarting Samson. Samson then kills 30 men to pay his bet. The Philistines kill his wife anyways. Samson burns the harvest and puts the city at risk for starvation. They try to capture and kill him. He is able to turn the tables and kill a thousand of them. Not once in this sequence did Samson call on God. Every episode was a violation of God's law, whether it was marrying outside his people, keeping his Nazarite oath, or killing and murdering others. Yet God's plan was achieved. The Philistines were now weaker. There were fewer of them, and they had less ability to oppress Israel. Now Israel would still not take another generation or two to finally rid themselves of the Philistines. Now I feel we would miss the point of Judges if we did not examine ourselves in light of what we read in this book. I see that in today's church we have sought other gods. We have churches that place an importance on your best life now. They seek the riches of this world rather than the riches of God's grace and love. Other churches are looking for social justice where one social class has, has oppressed others and must be made to pay for the offenses no matter how distant they may be. They forget grace and mercy is available to all. The church has lost its place in inf of influence and seeks to regain it by supporting one political candidate or, riding, or ridding themselves of another. We have forgotten that our power does not rest in the highest offices of the Lamb, but on our knees in the throne room of God. We have been like Gideon, taking our victories and turning them into a ritual that throws all the attention on ourselves. We are like Barak, who, is commanded, uh, who was commanded to go against the oppressors, but turned his side when he saw how strong they were. Even more difficult to swallow, we have been like Jephthah, reminding others of the correct action but forgetting to correct our own actions. We have, been we have been like Samson, working entirely to satisfy our agenda and not considering the will of God. I will admit I had a very difficult time writing this. Now, my first issue was I could not find anything positive to say about Samson. Um, he did nothing right, and most of his actions could be described as sinful and against the covenant of God. 
He violated every single condition of his Nazarite vow. Even the actions that could be described as fulfilling God's will were motivated by selfishness and uh, a desire to avenge himself. Even though Samson's faults are so obvious, every time I sat down to write, I was stuck on the first verse. Here it is again. The Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight, so that the Lord handed them over to the Philistines forty years. They were oppressed, and they did not cry out to God. They did not repent and continued on their way as if nothing was wrong. I could not shake the idea that God's people did not repent and cry out for his help. As for us, the current condition of our society is very dark. The church has been told to take a back seat and keep quiet. Just like the Judites in our stories, we see some leaders bowing to what is oppressing us. Some church leaders bow to the ideas of social justice and pressure those who would speak up against it. They bow to the idea that we are owed riches and comfort because we belong to God. We seek solutions in politics or civil discourse and all we do is figuratively defile ourselves with dead bodies and honey. Despite that, God's plan is achieved. He works for us in our haze and in our bumbling. Right now I feel repentance is all we have. It is our only hope because God says he hears us when we repent. And honestly, I don't feel right pointing to you and asking you to repent. To do so is to risk passing the duty of repentance on to others and avoiding it myself. I have fallen for the trap that public discourse will change the hearts of men. I have fallen for the idea that society will be better if the heathen will change their ways. Turns out it's the church that needs to change. We have spoken recently that repentance requires a change in behavior. I truly believe that. But I find myself, far too often, repeating my behavior. I'm going to suggest that sincere repentance is of utmost importance, even if we fail to change. And that's where I'm going to leave you for today. And I look forward to our table talk, hoping that it helps us all understand the role of repentance. Is it possible to be sincere in our repentance, even without a change in behavior? And I hope this is a catalyst for discussion. And the second question is, what do you need to repent of today? Now, of course, this is a difficult question, and it's very personal, and I'm not intending to put anybody on the spot. Instead, in your own private time, think and pray about this. So we'll see you next week with the rest of the story, and have a good week and blessings to you all.